Good morning. It is a beautiful morning out there, isn't it? Well, I'm going to school, and uh, something that uh, we were then talking about in class, well, sort of talking in class, we don't have classroom talk, but uh, something that came to me, uh, what we've been talking about in the book is hearing from God. And the Lord touched my heart about talking about that today. Uh, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3, and we're going to start with verse 4 and go to verse 14. That the Lord called Samuel, and he answered, Here am I. And he ran the, unto Eli and said, Here am I, for you called me. And he said, I called not. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. And the Lord yet again call, called yet again Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for you did call me. And he answered, I called not, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time. And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here am I, for you did call me. And Eli per perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down on, in his place. And the Lord came and stood and called as at other times. Samuel, Samuel. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, oops, I'm sorry, I missed that. Samuel answered, Speak, for your servant hears. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also answer and I will also make an end. For I have told him that I will judge his house for ever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile and he restrained them not. And therefore I will have sworn unto the house of Eli, that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifice nor offering forever. Okay, the next is in Acts chapter 9, starting with verse 1 to verse 7. And Saul yet breathing and threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, the high priest, Oh, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way they were whether they were men or women he might bring them bound into, unto Jerusalem and as he journeyed he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven and he fell to the earth Heard, fell to the earth, heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he said, Who are you? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you persecute. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And he, trem and he trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will you have me do? To do, and the Lord said unto him, Arise and go to, into the city, and it shall 
B told you what you must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but not seeing no man. While studying, there's, you know, we, most people want to hear from God. But, you know, we have to be willing to really listen. We have to make sure that, you know, we don't, you know, there's no, no fear of wanting, you know, fear from he- wanting to hear from God. We have to put that fear aside. And we need to take him, be quiet, be still in order to hear from God. And that is where, you know, a lot of us have a problem with just being still. You know, it's just like when, when if all else fails, just stand. When all else fails, be still and listen. That's all we have to do is just listen, and he'll talk to us. So now I'm going to open, open now in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, and we thank you for this day. I ask you, Lord, to touch each and every one and, and help them, Lord, to take and listen to you, listen for your talk, for you, Lord, and help them to be still to listen, Lord Jesus, and open up their ears, Lord, that they may hear. Lord Jesus, we thank you for everything that you do for us, and I thank you, Lord, for all this time that we have together, and help us, Lord, to become one with each other, Lord, to be with you. In your precious holy name I pray, amen. Stand on our feet as we, as we open up our Bibles to the book of Revelation, last, bi- look, last book in the Bible, chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and I'm reading verses 14 down to verse 22 to the end of the chapter. Somebody say praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. As you're turning there, just a few quick announcements. Um, we have at 1030 every Sunday morning now, we have prayer here at the sanctuary. Amen. So I, I want to encourage everybody to come out early at 1030 rather than come out at 11 and uh, spend some time with the Lord in prayer. You know, it's really, really a good situation where we can pr- spend time and really prepare our hearts to worship the Lord when we pray. Amen. So that's uh, 1030 at every, every Sunday morning. Also, Wednesday night Bible study is at 7 o'clock. Uh, every Wednesday night we have um, an hour of Bible study from 7 to 8 o'clock. And it's, we're going through the Gospel of John right now. A lot of insight in the Word. Amen. So I encourage you to come on out to the Bible studies. Every Thursday morning we're here in prayer at 730. Uh, intercessory prayer. So, um, you know, if you can come out on Thursday morning if, you're, if your work schedule allows it, please come on out. Even if you can only come out for a few minutes, a little while, that's all right too. Amen. And also, if you have any prayer requests, let us know what those requests are so we can lift those up before the Lord. Because we, we believe, how many you know that, that, that God answers prayer? Amen. A week from today is going to be the fellowship dinner after our service. So if you'd like to bring a covered dish, you may do so. If not, just make sure that you bring your appetite. Amen. So uh, looking forward to that. You know, I'll be making my uh, buffalo wings and, you know, uh, croissants. So, uh, you know, um, so we can all come out to that and, and, and really um, enjoy some fellowship. Amen. Praise the Lord. Are you at Revelation 3? Amen. Starting with verse 14 in the Word of God. And unto the angel of the church of, La- of the Laodiceans writes, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot, a cold rather, nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiments, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent." Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, 
even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Let us pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord God, I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you speak through me in this message today. Lord, I pray that if any of us have gotten lukewarm, that, Lord God, we would hear this message today and repent from sin and have a closer relationship with you, Lord God. I pray, Father, that we repent from things that are not pleasing to you, things that perhaps we're doing or perhaps not even doing, that, Lord God, I pray that you would just have your way and will in our lives. I pray that we live pleasing lives to you, Heavenly Father, that, Lord, we have encouragement in these last days, that, Lord God, many situations and problems are happening in people's lives. Many people are withdrawing from you, Lord. Many people are backsliding away from you. But, Father God, we pray that we would be hot and on fire for you. Help us, Lord God, in this message to grow in our relationship with you. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the church. And we thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Praise the Lord. How many of us want to have a closer relationship with God? Amen. You know, in these last days, church, how many know many, many people are going by the wayside? There are some people I mentioned last week when I was preaching, a gentleman that was on fire for God years and years ago. I went to church with him, and, and this guy was just really, really in, in, enthusiastic and encouraged in the things of God. And I saw him at the mall one day, and he just said to me, he wants nothing whatsoever to do with God any longer. And it just broke my heart, amen? How many of you know, church, we've got we to gotta continue to fight, and we've got to finish the race. Somebody say, finish the race. Irregardless of what other people are doing all around us, irregardless of what's happening, how many of you know, church, we have to go ahead and say, Lord, I want to have a closer and closer relationship with you. I know I got problems. I know I have an enemy called Satan trying to take me out of the race. But how many of you know that greater is he that is in you, the Holy Spirit of God, than he that is in the world, that is the devil? Amen? Somebody say, I have victory this morning. Amen. You know, these seven churches are so very, very important, and I thank God for last Thursday, whereas we had the United Night of Prayer here at 7 o'clock, there was about 35 of us here at the church, there was about 8 of us pastors here as well, and we had different churches, in fact, the seven different churches of Revelation were placed on each one of these pillars in the church, and we had prayer stations, we went around and we prayed in, in, over each one of these stations concerning these churches. And how many know, church, it's good to take an inventory of our hearts and in our lives. Lord, as I read about these seven churches, what are the weak points and what are the strong points, the weak points in my life that I need to repent from and that I can have a closer relationship with you as a result, amen? How many know, church, that we, we have to be a people that want to please God, amen? I just want to review quickly, and let's look at these seven churches that we talked about the last several weeks. We, we started off with a church called Ephesus. Ephesus was church number one in these seven churches. And Ephesus was a loveless church. What the Lord told Ephesus is he says, listen, you guys, you church, you're doing all the right things. You know, and you're doing all the stuff. I mean, you know, you're going to church, you're teaching Bible study, you're, you're reading the word, and, and, and you're doing all your witnessing for me. But the one problem, Ephesus, that you have is you lost your first love. You've got to come back to me once again and do the original works that you were doing when you first knew me as Lord and Savior. My challenge is this, church, have we lost our first love? Are we as excited as we once were in the things of God that, 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 that the God put on our heart when we first received him as our Lord and Savior? Amen? How I many know, oh, praise God, we've got to continue to come. We've got to continue to praise and worship and, and magnify his name. Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40 says, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Somebody say, all your heart. Amen. Your heart is your, your will, your emotions, your, your thoughts. Amen. That's our very heart. In other words, the, 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 the Bible says that the person who believes in his heart that there is no God is a fool. How many know the heart is not just, you know, just the head? In other words, it's the deep, deep, in other words, Lord, I really love you with all of my heart. Amen? So the Bible says, love the Lord God with the, all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. One person one time told me it's kind of arrogant that we have to love ourselves. That kind of sounds kind of weird. I said, yeah, but it's biblical. We have to love ourselves. If we don't love ourselves, how in the world are we going to have a lot of problems loving our neighbor? 
If, 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 I'm, if I'm, you know, um, you know if, if I'm bad to myself, I'm, you know, I'm going to be bad to my neighbor. You follow what I'm saying? In other words, we have to love our neighbor as a self, and the love originally comes from God. Amen? In other words, his unconditional love for us to love our neighbor as ourself. So the first, this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So everything that we can do, all the Ten Commandments are summed up in love. Amen? If we're going to love somebody, we're not going to steal from them. If we're going to love somebody, we're not going to commit adultery. If we're going to love somebody, we're not going to steal, we're not going to hurt, we're not going to murder, we're not going to hate. Amen? So it's all about love. Somebody say love. Amen. Now that's the first church. The second church we talked about was the church at Smyrna. Somebody say Smyrna. Now Smyrna was the persecuted church. Now we don't, in the United States of America, we as Christians don't even know what persecution really means. If you go to other countries and you see these YouTube videos of Christians that are standing up for the Lord and, and these people, these governments and so forth, are telling them, renounce your faith, renounce Jesus, and they're literally having their heads cut off. They're going to prison. They're going to all, you know, and how many know that they are standing firm in the Lord? They're really being persecuted, amen? The Bible tells us, uh, the church at Smyrna, it says, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. How I many know, church, we got to be faithful until death? He, to, he who endures until the end will be saved. I don't believe this doctrine. Once you accept Jesus, you're always saved. You're never going to lose your salvation. You can never backslide. I read in my Bible as Jesus, uh, you know, uh, addresses these different churches, and he says, repent or I'm going to blot your name out of the book of life. Now, how I many you know God doesn't make false threats? If your name is in there, how many you know your name can come out? He wouldn't be saying, I'll blot it out unless you repent. Somebody say, glory to God. So how many you know we got to grow in our relationship with the Lord on a daily basis? The third church was the worldly church, which is Pergamum. Somebody say Pergamum. Now, church, how many you know that we don't want to be worldly? If we call ourselves Christians and have a bumper sticker on our car that says, I love Jesus, and we wear a T-shirt that says John 3.16 on it, how many you know we can't be living like the world? There's got to be a difference. We got to dare to be different, amen? Romans chapter 12, verse 2 tells us in the message version of the Bible, it says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Amen. Now, how many you know that scripture is powerful? It tells us not to be like the world. It tells us, that, you know, not to do the things of the world and so forth. Amen? We have to say, Lord, I want to obey you. I, I want to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer only. Amen? The next church we talked about a few weeks ago was the church in a place called Thyatira. And this is the paganized church. How many know that whatever's going on in this world right now, we can't get paganized? In other words, we've got to say, Lord, you know, they had the, they had the goddess Diana and so forth in this particular city, and, and what happened is the church started to, to sway towards those things. How many know we as a church have to stand up for what is right? The Word of God is the Word of God, amen? God says, I change not in the book of Malachi. The Word is never going to change. Now, we know that centuries change, we know that people change, we know that, you know, um, technology changes, but God's word ain't never going to change. The same gospel that saved people hundreds of years ago uh, is saving people today. Somebody say, praise God, amen? Hallelujah, praise the Lord. The next church we talked about was the church at Sardis. Sardis was the dead church or the lifeless church. How many know church, Changing Lives Christian Church doesn't want to be dead? We want to be alive in the Lord, amen? We want to be saying, Lord, I'm alive and, and I praise you and magnify your mighty name. We don't want to be dead, amen? The Bible says, I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. I mean, you know, people can have, a, even Christians can have a reputation of being alive in the Lord, but inside God looks at them and sometimes they're dead. I mean, you know, we want to be alive inside and out. We want to be alive. In other words, let me just say this. If you're going to be a Christian, go all the way. If you're going to be a Christian, go all the way, 
God doesn't want 50% believers. God doesn't want 75% believers, amen? The Bible says, and we're going to be talking about getting hot or cold, and we're going to talk about this in just a moment. Now, this church at Sardis, they were falling far short of fulfilling their obligations as believers. Once we receive Jesus, how many know there's, there's responsibilities concerning that? Now, if I say that, Lord, I'm accepting you as my personal Lord and Savior, you are God, now I have this relationship with you. I want to know you more. How am I going to know you more? Well, I've got to read your word. Just once or twice? No. I've got to read it every day. I've got to come to church because I want to praise and worship you. I want to hear the message of the gospel preached. I want my faith to increase in you. Amen? I want to come to Bible studies. I want to come to prayer meetings, Lord. I want to go ahead and live the Christian life the way you want me to live it. Amen? I want to use my time for you. Amen? I want to share your word with other people. Share the good news of the gospel. We have obligations as believers, but sometimes people don't understand that. Amen? We also have to know that God wants us to walk with humbleness in our hearts. We can't get to the point where we say, well, you know, I have all kinds of pride and I'm better than you. I know more of the Bible than you and so forth and so on. We all need one another. I mean, I don't care if somebody's been a pastor for the last, you know, 60 years. And if that pastor has PhDs and all kinds of college degrees and things like that, he still needs his congregation in order to keep on growing in the Lord. We all need one another. Amen. Somebody say praise God for that. Amen. What about the church at Philadelphia? We talked about that church last week. This is on the only church out of the seven that Jesus did not rebuke for anything. He says, you have little strength. Now, being that we have little strength sometimes, it doesn't mean we had no strength. The Bible tells us I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. So we can say, okay, Lord, I know that you strengthen me. I know that you're with me. I know, Lord God, that, that I'm going to grow in my relationship with you and that you truly do love me. Even as the sister shared in her testimony today, in the worst, darkest hour of the night, when things happen in our lives and, and, and the enemy is trying to throw his fiery darts and make us think about negative things and things going on, we can cry out to Jesus and he's right there. He's as close as a thought. Amen? That song on K-Love, just say Jesus. Amen? How many of you know there's power in the name of Jesus? Praise be to God. Amen. Let's look at this church called um, at Laodicea. Let's talk about the destination. Revelation 3.14 tells us, write this letter to the angel of the church at Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. Now, the, this, this city at Laodicea was a very wealthy city. It was located on the road to Colossae, about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia. About 35 years before this letter was written, Laodicea was destroyed by an earthquake, but it had the wealth and ability to rebuild. Laodicea was the wealthiest of the seven cities known for its banking industry, manufacture of wool, and its medical school that produced eye solve. But the city always had a problem with its water supply. At one time, an aqueduct was built to bring water to the city from hot springs. But, the time, but by the time the water reached the city, it was neither hot nor cold, but lukewarm. The church had become as bland and as tepid water that came into the city. Amen? So you have the situation where this water's coming in, and by the time it got there, it was very, very lukewarm. Now, the believers in Laodicea did not take a stand for anything. You ever hear the old saying, if you don't take a stand for anything, you'll fall for anything? How many know as Christians, we've got to take a stand for Jesus? Somebody say amen. We've got to say, you know, if somebody tries to come against our faith, whatever the case is, we've got to take a stand for Jesus. This, these believers did not take a stand literally for anything. Indifference led to idleness. By neglecting to do anything for Christ, the church had become hardened and self-satisfied and was destroying itself. How many you know any church that becomes hardened and self-satisfied with itself will destroy itself? We have to be a people at this church that we say, Lord, I am trusting in you. Lord, I am depending on you. Lord, I, I can't do this myself and I don't want to do this myself. I need others, Lord God. I want to walk in humility and be humble before you, Lord God. Now, there is nothing more nauseating than a half-hearted, in-name-only Christian who is self-sufficient. Don't settle for following God halfway. 
Let Christ fire up your faith and get you into action. Amen? How I many know, oh, praise God, you know, I, I, you know, there are some people that are finishers. When you start a project, you want to finish that project. Then there's other people, they start three or four different projects, and they're only halfway done of each one. Amen? What if you were a carpenter and you, for a living you built houses? Well, let's say you started building a house and you didn't finish it. It was only halfway done. You laid the foundation, you went ahead and you put the drywall up and so forth, and uh, you just kind of left it like that. Then you went to another house and started building that, and that was only maybe halfway done. Then another house. How many of you know as Christians we got to be finishers? You know, when you start a project, finish that project. Amen? You know, go all the way, get that thing done. As Christians, we got to say, Lord, I want to go all the way with you. Everything in this book, Lord, that, that, that it has, I want it. Amen? I want to grow in my relationship with you, Lord God. I, I don't want to just do a, you know, a, you know just, just, just go ahead and do a one-minute devotional a day. I, I want to really study your word, Lord. I want to grow in my relationship with you, Lord God. I, I want you to be my Lord. I, I want to go ahead and share your word with other people. I want to be used of you in your kingdom. How many know, church, we've got to be finishers? Finishers, amen? Secondly, let's look at the rebuke concerning this church at Laodicea. Revelation chapter 3, verse 15 through 17 says, I know all the things you do. Let me stop there. How many know God knows everything you and I do? We can never pull a wool over God's eyes. Well, I'm going to sin for a couple of weeks. God, you can take a vacation, and you can leave my house for a while, and I'm going to sin, and then you can come back again when I'm all set. It doesn't work that way. How many know God knows everything? He knows the motives of our heart, why we do what we do, why we think the way we think, uh, why we, you know, the actions that we do. Amen? He knows our thoughts. He knows what we're doing in the middle of the night. He knows what we're doing in the middle of the day. God knows everything that we do. And sometimes it gets a little scary when Jesus says, one day in heaven you will be judged by Christ as a Christian. Now, if I'm judged by the Lord, and he says, Lord, how am I going to be judged? By every word that you said when you were a believer, and every thought that you thought, and every action that you did. So how many of you know that keeps us on our toes? Wow, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to be judged for that. So that temptation over there, I'm going to say no to that. No way, I'm not going to do that in the name of Jesus. Amen? The devil says, oh, you know, you, you go ahead. You can just go ahead and partake of that thing. You need to escape for a little while. You're going through a lot of problems in your life. And all of a sudden, your, your insecurity comes in. and You want to run to something that you know is sinful, but you just want to escape from those thoughts for a little while or that situation just for a little while. But yet, after you wake up the next morning, that thing is still there. Now you feel doubly worse because you know you sinned against your Lord. Amen? We have to understand that. A lot of insecurities in life, we run to things that we shouldn't be running to. We need to get on our knees before God. We need to get back to the altar again and say, Lord, I give myself to you. Don't worry about anything, but pray about everything the Bible says. Amen? We have to say, okay, Lord, you know what I'm going through, and I know, Lord God, you will get me through this situation. You will never allow anything to happen to me that, is not, that, 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 is, that you don't already know about. Amen? Sometimes things happen to us and we say, Lord, are you still up there? Do you, understand, do you see what's going on here? I mean, come on, Lord, look, look what's happening here. But you know something? If we focus on the Lord every single day in the good times, we can also focus him every single day in the bad times. Because, Lord, I know that you're right there. I know I'm going to get through this, Lord God, and I know that you are Lord. Amen? So no word, the Bible goes on to say, I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. What is the Lord saying? He's saying this. All right. You people at Laodicea, you call yourself Christians. You're self-sufficient. You don't really feel like you need God, but you got the Christian name tag. And you're lukewarm. What you're doing, church, at Laodicea, is you're making me sick to my stomach, is what Jesus is saying. He's saying that I want you to be 100% hot on fire for me. All the way as a believer, a true, genuine believer through and through. Or just don't even call yourself a Christian. Don't have the name tag on your back. Don't even claim to be one and get as cold as you can and enjoy all the world that you want. That's what he's saying. He, Jesus would rather have Christians 
that would not claim to be one if they're just playing games with God rather than have them play games with God. What, what's going, why? Because what's happening is the world, the unbelievers are looking at the Christians who are lukewarm and their heart's not really in the Lord. They just have a name tag, but they're living like the world, doing the things of the world, behaving like the world. And then these people that don't know Jesus are saying, what is the difference? Why do I even want to be a Christian? You have a name, you have a bumper sticker. That's the only difference between you and me. You follow what I'm saying? But yet, if we're really true believers and we love the Lord, it doesn't mean we don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean we don't fall sometimes. It doesn't mean we don't say something that we shouldn't say sometimes. It, 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 whatever the case is, if we're really, really walking with the Lord, how many of you know that people are going to know that guy is a believer? That woman, she's a believer. She's different. Amen? She doesn't go with all the dirty jokes when her co-workers are saying dirty jokes, you know, and she doesn't do that, and she prays for people, and sometimes people talk behind her back, and, you know, they call her Miss Holier Than Thou or whatever the case is, but she never ever retaliates with people like that because she loves God. And let me tell you a little secret. Even though people may say things about you and me as a believer, you just wait for the day when they are going through a really tough time. Who are they going to come for prayer, they're going to come to you and me. Amen? They're going to, why? Because, because we, they know that, okay, there are people of prayer. That I'm going to go to them. I'm going through this terrible situation. I just got a bad news from the doctor. I got can terminal cancer. My husband just went ahead and, you know, and, and, and all of a sudden he's got heart disease and I need, I need to cry out to God. I got to get somebody to pray for me. They're going to come to you and me. Amen? So how many know, praise God, we have to be on fire for the Lord. Amen? But the Bible says in verse 16, but since you are lukewarm, uh, 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 but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So what is the Lord saying here? These people were very well off. They had a lot of money. They had no problem. They have a big banking industry going on. The medical field, they were making eye solve, and I'll tell you what, they were doing pretty well. They had big houses with several bedrooms. They, they, they had probably, if, 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 if automobiles were in their day, they'd probably be driving around in really nice, nice cars and everything. They, they claimed to be Christians, but they would say, hey, listen, we got everything we need. We're all set. Let me say this. What would happen to you as a believer and you watch them by television, if somebody walked up to you tomorrow and gave you a check for $2 million and says, that's yours, what would you do? Somebody might say, I get everything I need. Well, maybe you'd have materialistically what you need. You'd, you'd have probably a new car, a new house, you know, the whole nine yards, whatever, new outfits, new whatever, right? But... Even if we have everything in this world, we become millionaires with, with material possessions. If we don't have God, we don't have nothing. Paul the Apostle said it this way. He says, I count all things in this life as rubbish, as garbage, as, as opposed to my relationship with God. I want a deeper and closer relationship with my Lord more than anything you could ever give me materially in this world. If somebody walked up to you and says, hey, look, if you don't claim to be a Christian anymore, I'm going to make you a millionaire, are you going to just say, okay, let's do it? Or are you going to say, are you kidding me? I'm talking about eternal life. I only have that through Christ Jesus, my Lord. There is nothing this world could ever buy me in order to take that place. Amen? we got to say, you know, what does it profit uh, for a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I mean, you, you know, you could have everything in this life, but I'll tell you what, like Sister Celine shit, somebody could just go wham and drop dead of a heart attack. We could have everything we want and the next day die. What good is it? We have to have Jesus in our hearts. We got to be, spirit, we got to be born again, amen? We have to have our spirit, man, inside of us, connected to God to have that personal relationship with him. That's what Jesus meant in John chapter 3 when he told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, what do you mean? Go back in my mother's womb and come out again? What do you mean, born again? Are you talking about being born twice physically, Jesus? No, 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 I'm not talking about that, Nicodemus. You must be born of water. In other words, you're physically born by mom and dad and also of the Spirit, my Holy Spirit. Amen. So in other words, what he was saying is you have to be born again, meaning that you have a relationship with God. Amen? Because now your spirit is alive, born again. 
See, every person has a spirit, but a lot of people are walking around spiritually dead because they don't know Jesus. The only way our spirit, amen, inside of us can be alive is to receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Isn't that good news? It's kind of like having, okay, Pastor Craig, you know, you've got a cell phone over here. All right, so I have a cell phone, and by, I, I got to charge my cell phone twice a day now. It's an old one. It's an S6 Galaxy, and uh, I use the thing all the time and so forth. I, I, you know, I mean, but the whole point is this. If somebody said, Pastor Craig, here's a brand new cell phone. I just want to bless you. I said, oh, thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. That's a wonderful gift. Now, I haven't activated it, Pastor. I haven't talked to Verizon, I haven't talked to Sprint, I haven't talked to AT&T, I haven't talked to anybody, uh, but it's not activated, okay? I have the phone, but it's no good to me until it gets activated. Let's picture that this phone has a spirit. And uh, finally, um, on another telephone, I call Verizon and say, hey, I'd like to get one of your plans, you know, with my cell phone. And I give them the number and they say, okay, you're activated. Now I can make phone calls, I can send text messages, emails through my phone well it's the same thing being born again it's kind of like if you're not born again you have a cell phone that's not activated you have no connection with god you can't really exist right until you know your maker and that connection comes through being born again it comes through saying jesus i receive you as my personal lord and savior i put my faith my trust my hope in you lord i repent for my sins i want to change my life i want you to change my life i i have this relationship with you now lord and it's awesome now i want to grow in this relationship amen. now you're activated you follow what i'm saying amen, amen. but you know a lot of people they they well you know i don't want to you know i some of those christians you know i knew a believer who was a christian and, and he fell into sin and i knew this pastor who claimed to be a christian and he ran away with another woman and, and i knew this one over here this guy was a tv evangelist and he fell by the wayside i don't want nothing to do with that but it's just like it, it's stereotyping and it, that's the same thing as a football player who goes to prison because they did some kind of a terrible thing and then you saying, all the NFL are the same way. I want nothing to do with football. You follow what I'm saying? Believe it or not, there are real Christians, amen? Somebody say, praise the Lord. Somebody say, I'm a real believer. Somebody say, I'm the real deal. Amen. Somebody say, praise, praise be to God. So, but since you are like Luke 1, verse 16, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Amen? Now, there is no word of commendation, um, uh, no word of commendation, rather, was extended to the Laodicean church. They were pictured as utterly abhorrent to Christ because they were lukewarm. This was addressed to the church and also to the messenger of the, or the pastor whom some believe was Archippus. And if you check Colossians chapter 4, verse 17, it mentions that. It is improbable, however, that Archippus, if he had been the pastor of the church, was still living. In referring to the church as lukewarm, Christ had in mind that this was its permanent situation. In their feasts, as well as in their religious sacrifices, people in the ancient world customarily drank what was cold or hot, never lukewarm. This rebuke would have been especially meaningful to this church, for, what, for water was piped to the city from a place called Hierapolis, a few miles north. By the time the water reached Laodicea, it was lukewarm. Now, if you know Pastor Craig for a while, you know that I like coffee. Amen? How many of us like coffee? Raise your hand. It's okay to drink coffee. You know. Yeah. All right. Now, if I go to Dunkin' Donuts and I pull up at the window, I don't ask them, could I have a lukewarm cup of coffee? Because frankly, I'd probably take one sip and, and just spit it right out. If I pull up at Dunkin' Donuts and if I want a hot cup of coffee in the winter, I will tell them, would you please give me a hot coffee? I expect it to be hot, not lukewarm. Now, in the, in the summertime, when I drive up to Dunkin' Donuts' window and I say, I would like an iced coffee, I expect that to be really cold, full of ice. You ever, you ever have an iced coffee and, you know, you're sipping it and you're doing a project or whatever you're doing 
and then the ice finally melts, it's a hot summer day, and next thing you know, you take one more sip, thinking it's going to be cold, but it's been sit sitting there for a while, and it's lukewarm. Doesn't it make you sick? Like, ugh, this is gross, <laughs> I'm going to throw that out, right? You want to get rid of it, because it's lukewarm. Well, that's the same thing. I want either cold or I want hot, I don't want in the middle. And what Jesus is saying about our relationship with him, he wants us to be 100% on fire for the Lord, amen, or 100% or not serving God at all, amen? So how many know, praise God, that we can say, okay, Lord, I don't want to be lukewarm. I've got to go ahead and I've got to be proactive in my relationship with you. It's not like I'm on automatic pilot and things just happen in the, in the way. I've got, to, I've got to intentionally get into your word every day. Whether my flesh feels like it or not, I'm going to intentionally read the Word. I'm going to intentionally pray every day. I'm going to intentionally come out to church. I'm going to intentionally come out to Bible study. I'm going to intentionally witness and share the Word of God with people. Amen? Intentionality is very, very important. Isn't that correct? You know, so we've got to be proactive and we've got to say, Lord, this doesn't happen automatically, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to really, really grow in my relationship with you. See, their being lukewarm spiritually was evidenced by their being content with their material wealth and their being unaware of their spiritual poverty. Christ used strong words to describe them. He said they were wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. He's talking spiritually, amen? How many know it's more important in our spirit that we walk with the Lord than what we have? What about the exhortation? Revelation chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, it says, So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so that you will not be shamed by your nakedness. An ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. You know what indifference means? I don't care about that anymore. I'm indifferent to it. Indifference means you have a spirit of apathy, meaning that, oh, I don't care about the things of God anymore. I don't, I just got nothing to do with that anymore, amen? Indifference. But how many know that these people, the Lord's telling them, I correct and I discipline everyone I love, and he's telling them to repent. He's telling them to come back to him. He's saying be diligent and turn from your indifference, amen? They were urged to buy not ordinary gold but refined gold referring to the to that which would glorify god and make them truly rich through its banking industry the city had material wealth in fact they had a lot of material wealth but the church lacked spiritual richness though they had beautiful clothes they were urged to wear white clothes symbolic of righteousness uh, which would cover their spiritual nakedness amen you know, white is symbolic of, of, um, of purity. White is symbolic in the Bible of, of holiness, amen? So, so the Lord is telling them to, to, to wear white clothes and so forth. As wool was a major product of the area, Laodicea was especially famous for a black garment made out of black wool. What they needed instead was pure white clothing, amen? Remember I talked about the medical industry they made eye salve? Then Christ exhorted them to put salve on their eyes. A medical school was located in Laodicea at the temple of Acapius, I believe that's how you pronounce it, which offered a special salve to heal common eye troubles of the Middle East. What they needed was not this medicine, but spiritual sight. Somebody say spiritual sight. Amen? The church at Laodicea is typical of a modern church quite unconscious of its spiritual needs and content with beautiful buildings and all the material things money can buy. This is a searching and penetrating message. To all such, the exhortation to, is to be earnest and repent. Christ rebuked them because he loved them, which love would, would also bring chastisement on this church. Amen? You know... I come in this church and, and I thank God for this wonderful building that we have here that we worship God in, but these walls in this building has nothing to do with you and I in our hearts. We don't worship the building, but how many you know that we worship God? God is concerned with who comes in this building to worship Him. He's concerned with every one of our hearts. Amen? He wants us to grow in our relationship with Him. Amen? He wants us to continue to persevere in the name of Jesus. We have an adversary that comes and he tries to take us out of the race. But how many you know, church, that you have somebody, the Holy Spirit living in you, that, that is so much greater than the adversary? 
When you're going through a problem in your life, don't ever, you know, keep the old Christian smile on and, and so forth. And I, how are things, brother, sister? Oh, I'm just blessed. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, if you're dying inside, you need to reach out to somebody and talk about it. Isn't that right? It's okay to say we're blessed, yes, but how many of you know that the Bible says to bear ye one another's burdens in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2. If you're going through a tough time, you know, give me a call, sit down in my office, let's talk about it, let's pray together. Let's, let's, let's get your mind thinking in, in the directions that the Lord wants you to be thinking in. Amen? Because that's what I'm here for. I hear people all the time with their problems and situations. One thing I never do is judge anybody. I don't care if a person came in my office and said, I'm terribly addicted to pornography, or I'm this, or I'm that, or whatever, I'm in an affair, whatever. I want to sit there, and I want to pray with that person. I want to teach them the word, and I want to go ahead and see them have victory over whatever they're going through. I'm not a pastor that's going to point the finger, oh, you're doing that? You call yourself a Christian? Oh, I don't believe this. Oh, my gosh. You know that, ad, that judgmental attitude will push that person even deeper into their sin that they're in? Rather than saying, you know something, you're going through that, L uh, let me pray for you, let me encourage you, let me be there for you, amen? You see, uh, an atmosphere of acceptance in, is, going to, is going to breed help with that person's heart. There's too many people that are pointing the finger. How many know we need not point the finger? If I point my finger at you, I get three coming back at me. <laughs> right? So, therefore, the Bible says in, in Matthew chapter 7, judge not, or ye shall be judged. Amen? For with the same measure you use, it's going to be measured back to you once again. Amen? By the Lord. So, dramatically, Christ pictured himself as standing outside and knocking on a door. He's standing outside knocking on a door. In a familiar painting, the latch is shown, but is assumed to be on the inside. Uh, it's not shown, rather, but it's assumed to be on the inside. The appeal is for those who hear to open the door. To them, Christ promised, I will go in and eat with him and he with me. With Christ on the outside, there can be no fellowship or genuine wealth. Christ, with Christ on the inside, there is powerful and wonderful fellowship and sharing of the marvelous grace of God. What an appeal to Christians rather than to non-Christians, amen? This raises the important question concerning the extent of one's intimate fellowship with Christ. To those who respond, Christ promises to give the right to sit with him on his throne and share his victory. How many of us are looking forward to the next life? You know, in this life, that's why it's so, so important. We don't physically see God. You know, Jesus doesn't come, you know, and, and, and give us a phone call on our cell phone or send us a text and say, hey, let's go for coffee. Let's go to Heavenly Donuts. All right? That's why we have to say, Lord, I can't physically see you, but I seek your presence I, I want to be in your presence, Lord God. I, I want to go ahead and worship you, Lord. I want to go ahead and feel the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. Lord God, I just, I just want to continue to grow my relationship with you. Amen? But you've got to make a pro act. You have to, you know, it's not going to happen automatically. You've got to make that effort. That's why I always encourage people, come to church every time the church doors are open because you're going to be encouraged in the things of God. Amen? So verse 22 talks about that one, once again, the invitation to listen and respond is given. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Now, this church is one of the churches that I had represented on one of these pillars I talked about earlier at the United Night of Prayer. This was church number seven. And it was located right there, the church of Laodicea. And so, on the paper that I had written, I wrote down this. I says that, that we truly our Christians who live the Christian life both inside and out. That should be our prayer. Let us not be bad examples or stumbling blocks to those who do not know Christ. Jesus said be either hot or cold. He was in essence saying either don't claim to be a Christian at all, cold, or be hot, be a genuine Christian living your life as one. You see, when people claim, quote-unquote, to be a Christian and live like the world, that is, people who are not Christians, they are a terrible example, and as a result, people who do not know Christ are totally turned off to Christianity. Jesus himself said in Revelation 3.16, So then, because you are lukewarm, and neither hot, a cold rather, nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, how many know that's, that's strong words? But how many know God wants us to live the life, Amen. Now, what is indifferent? Indifferent means, I mentioned this earlier, I get ahead of myself a little bit in the message. It means a lack of interest in or concern about something. Indifferent. Somebody might say, hey, you a sports fan? Do you watch the Patriots? 
No, nah, not really. So they're indifferent. In other words, okay, I, I'm not really interested. You ask somebody else, are you a sports fan? Do you watch the Patriots? Are you kidding me? I get, tr I get, I get my Patriots shirt on all the time with number 12. Are you kidding me? I watch the Patriots all the time. Oh, yeah, I'm, 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 def I'm, I'm an avid fan. I'm watching it all the time. You know, that means that they're on fire for the Patriots, <laughs> if I can use that term, amen? So in other words, indifference means I don't really care about something, amen? Backsliding, what does that mean? To grow cold and indifferent to spiritual matters or even fall away. Backsliding, to grow cold or in indifferent to spiritual matters. Now, how many know church we have an adversary called Satan? And let me tell you this, he's been around, and I'm not trying to give him credit, but I'm just telling you what the scripture teaches. He's been around for a lot longer than you and I have. Isn't that right? He knows how to place demons to, to go ahead and to observe your life. And he knows exactly where your weak points are, where your strong points are. And he knows how to scheme and how to manipulate. And, and, and the Bible says he uses devices to try to get us to backslide away from God. His main concern is us not walking with the Lord anymore. He doesn't care how he does it. He could even make somebody rich or give somebody something they want. Just as long as they don't serve the Lord, that's all he cares about. Right? So we have to know and pray against his schemes and devices in the name of Jesus. You see, if anything or anyone is pulling you away from the Lord, that's not of God. Well, I guess it's just not meant for me to be a Christian. I guess it's just meant for me to go to hell for an eternity, so I won't serve God anymore. No. Amen? How many of you know we've got to focus our relationship with God more than ever these days? We've got to say, Lord, have your way and will in my heart and life. I love you, Lord God, and I want to grow in my relationship with you. I, I don't want the devil trying to make me go into anything at all that would be pulling me away from you. I want to continue to serve you all the days of my life. You know, Paul said it this way, we each are running a race. And how many know we got to go through the, the finish line of the race? Just the other day, I was watching the Olympics, and they were doing a, I forgot how many miles this run was, but boy, I'll tell you what, those runners were exhausted. But every one of them crossed the finish line. As soon as they crossed, they just fall down on their back. They were so tired. But the point is, they may not have, have been number one, but they still finished the race. You see, you and I got to say, I am going to be determined to finish this race. I am not going to let anyone, I don't care if it's a spouse, I don't care if it's a mom, a dad, a kid, one of my kids, my worker, my money, whatever it is, I'm not letting no one and nothing pull me away from Jesus. You got to have the attitude, if my spouse totally doesn't serve the Lord, I'm still going to serve the Lord. You got to have the attitude that, you know, you get in involved in a new relationship and you're a Christian. You don't want to get involved with somebody that doesn't know Jesus. Well, I'll missionary date him. No, you won't. I'll convert him. No, you won't. <laughs> He'll convert you. <laughs> I'm serious, man. I've seen this over and over and over. But he's so handsome. He makes 100 grand a year, Pastor. I mean, he's a Christian in his own way. In his own way? Is there another gospel that I don't know about? Somebody say, praise God. You know, we got to know and understand that. you got to make up your mind. Make an absolute commitment. Absolute commitment. Lord, I'm going to serve you all the days of my life. I'm committing my life to you. I'm not going to let nobody or nothing pull me away from you, Lord God, no matter what happens, Lord. You have to be first in my life, then everything else is secondary. See, if you put Jesus first in your life, then secondary things are not going to take first place. But if you're, if you're out of order... If you're going to put your family before God, or if you're going to put this one before God, or that one before, or career before God, money before God, then it's out of order, amen? And then you're going to go in that direction. But how many you know, church, we've got to put Jesus number one. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then these things, all these things on the earth will be added unto us, amen? So how many you know we've got to make that commitment, amen? We've got to absolutely make that. And don't walk in comparisons. Paul the Apostle said comparisons are very dangerous. If you're comparing yourself with someone else, well, you know, I know one Christian, they were serving God for a while, and they, they walked away from God. Why can't I walk away from God? Why would you want to walk away from God? Amen? You know, we got to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to, you know, okay, that one, that one fell over there, I'm going to pray for him. That one fell over there, I'm going to pray for her. I am not going to go in that same direction. I'm going to continue to walk with the Lord and, and, and serve him. Amen? You see, if anything or anyone is more important than God in our life, Satan is going to use the, that individual to pull us away from God. Something will happen to them, as something they'll do something, and it will pull us away from the Lord. Amen? So how many of you know it's really, really important? We're talking about eternity. Somebody say eternity. 
The words we never ever want to hear is depart from me for I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. That's found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. You know how scary that is? These are people who went to church. These are people who served God. These are people who did all the right stuff. These were people that were very religious. And you would think, are you kidding me? Lord, I taught Sunday school. I did this, I did that. He says, I never knew you personally. You never had a personal relationship with me. You went through the motions, but you never had an intimate, close relationship with me. And that's what I've asked for in my word when you were on the earth. You follow what I'm saying? So church, we've got to have that close, intimate relationship with God. You know, we, it, it's a relationship. It's not a matter of going through motions. It's a matter of having that personal relationship. Amen? In a relationship, you, you know, like the sister was saying, you can talk to God throughout the course of the day. You don't have to necessarily just, okay, Lord, I need this, this, and this. We could just talk to him. Lord, I thank you for that happening. I thank you for that meeting going well today. Lord, I thank you for brother so-and-so, Lord God. He looks so good today. Thank you, Lord God, for, 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 for the beautiful, um, you know, the snow on the trees and the beautiful blue sky in the background. Thank you, Lord God, for giving us this day that, that it snowed last night. It didn't prevent us from coming to church this morning. Amen? We could just go ahead and just talk to him because I, he's our daddy. He's our heavenly father. Amen? He's an awesome God. Somebody say he's an awesome God. All right. I got to shut up real soon. All right. Now, in conclusion is this. The letters to the seven churches are a remarkably complete treatment of problems that face the church today. The recurring dangers of losing their first love of being afraid of suffering, doctrinal defection, moral departure, spiritual deadness, not holding fast, and lukewarmness are just as prevalent today as they were in first century churches. Because these letters come from Christ personally, they take on significance as God's final word of exhortation to the church down through the centuries. The final appeal is to all individuals who will hear. People in churches today would do well to listen. Amen, church? I just want to encourage you. Keep on walking with the Lord no matter what. Keep on praising God no matter what. Keep on, you know, saying, Lord, I know that you're with me. I know sometimes bad things will happen to me in my life, but I know, Lord God, you're right there with me. Amen? And keep on keeping on, and you've got to finish the race. And when does that happen, Pastor Craig? When one or two things happen. You either die and go home to be with the Lord, you've just finished the race, or the rapture of the church comes, and we just finished the race. How many know when the rapture comes, the only thing that's going to be left behind is our clothes? So don't, don't go crazy about your outfit, you know, amen, praise the Lord, you know, it's just, you know, some people are like, oh, no, no, Lord, no, my outfit, no, don't leave it on the earth, oh, my gosh. It's like that particular person, well, I'll just close with this. One, one time, when, when, when he was an attorney, and he was a very wealthy attorney, and he was driving down in his very expensive Mercedes, and he went to open up his door, and unfortunately, when he opened up his door, some, some guy went by, and he just, he just took his arm off, ripped it off, ripped the door down the street, and, and, and the attorney started screaming, and it was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I don't believe it. Where's my Rolex? <laughs> Let's stand on our feet and close the word of prayer. Amen. Hallelujah. Get some air in your system. Amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, and we praise your mighty name for this day, Lord God. I pray, Father God, that as this message was preached today, that we would, in Changing Lives Christian Church, be a very serious church, very much alive in you, Lord God. Very much, Lord, we want a closer and closer relationship with you. I lift up my brothers and sisters who are not here, Lord. For whatever reason, Lord God, some people have not been here for quite a while, even months. I pray for them, Lord. I, I, I lift them up before your throne room. We can only encourage people so much, Lord. We can't force them, Lord, to come back to the house of God. We can't force people to serve you. I just pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that they come back and be on fire for you, Lord God, to praise you and worship you and magnify your name. I pray that Christians, Lord, in this church, that we live according to your word, Lord God. Let us not get caught up in relationships that would pull us away from you. Let us not get caught up in careers that would take the place of you, Lord God. Let us not get caught up in anything at all in this world that would pull us away from you, Lord. We pray, Father God, that we'd grow in our relationships relationship like never before. I pray for those watching by television. I pray, Lord, if they don't have a home church, Lord God, that they come here, Lord God, to worship and to praise you, Lord God. I pray that people would be used in your kingdom, Lord God, for your glory. And Lord God, we just thank you for that, Father. We praise you, we magnify your name, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you. If you need prayer, come on up. Amen.